In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Verna Myers is many things. She is a cultural change catalyst. She's an influencer. She is a thought leader in diversity. She's a social commentator, and she's an author. She even describes herself as a recovering lawyer. I became acquainted with her and her work through a TED Talk. This TED Talk was entitled, How to Overcome Our Biases, Walk Boldly Toward Them. It is an absolutely amazing presentation, and I highly recommend it to you. What I remember most from her talk is this one line. Biases are the stories we make up about people before we know who they actually are. Let me say that again. Biases are the stories we make up about people before we know who they actually are. I have pondered this comment since I heard about it four years ago. It has served me well when I became all caught up in my assumptions or my righteous indignation or even my own prejudice. What stories, I ask myself, am I making up to justify my behavior? What stories am I making up that prevent me from knowing someone? What stories am I making up that prevent me from entering into relationship with my brothers or my sisters or my siblings? Nathaniel himself almost falls victim to this thought process. Philip tells Nathaniel that Philip has found the one about whom Moses and the prophets have written. I can almost see Nathaniel's eyes widen in hope of the fact that the Messiah has come. And I can see them become dismissive little squints upon hearing that this Messiah is from Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Nazareth was this small village in the northern part of the nation. It was in Galilee. It was away from just about any bright center of the universe. It was remote. It was a backwater. How in the world could the Messiah, the Son of God, come from there? Philip's response to Nathaniel is not to argue or to berate or to even challenge Nathaniel. It is simply to invite him into relationship. Philip says, come and see. I hear echoes of the psalmist, taste and see that the Lord is good. Philip's invitation is to experience God to meet this Messiah and for whatever reason, Nathaniel is in fact persuaded to come and meet Jesus. Before Nathaniel is even able to meet Jesus to say anything, Jesus shocks Nathaniel by saying that here is an Israelite in whom there is no guile. When asked how Jesus could possibly know this, Jesus replies, I saw you. I saw you over there under that fig tree. And this is enough for Nathanael. It is enough for Nathanael to proclaim Jesus as the Son of God. Jesus even tells Nathanael that he will see great things. Nathanael will see the heavens opened and angels going up and down from heaven to earth and back again. We hear echoes of the story of Jacob, who was called Israel, and who was in fact full of guile. While fleeing for his life, Jacob finally finds a place to rest in the wilderness. With a rock for his pillow, 
Jacob falls asleep, thinking that God was not with him, only to be shown a vision of a ladder going to heaven with angels moving up and down between heaven and earth. And we know that Nathanael did see the space between heaven and earth move closer together. Nathanael is only mentioned twice in John's Gospel. The first is at the very beginning in this passage that we have heard. The second mention is in the 21st chapter of the Gospel of John. And in that chapter, it is after the resurrection of Jesus, Nathanael is mentioned in this gathering of the disciples who were gathered on the Sea of Galilee. We can surmise that Nathanael was present for some, if not many, of the signs that Jesus worked. He may have been present at healings. He could have even seen Lazarus being raised from the dead. He may have been present in that upper room when Jesus breathed on the disciples, giving them the paraclete. We can only presume that Nathanael was a witness to the life and to the ministry of Jesus. And Nathanael would have missed all of it, everything, if he had remained bound up in his own prejudice. What allowed Nathanael to move past the stories that he had made up in his head about this little backwater town was an invitation from Philip to come and see. That's it. Nathaniel was not won over by theology or scripture or creeds. Nathaniel found relationship and community through experience. The older I get, and I am getting older, as my faith matures, I am finding that my relationship with God grows deeper through experiential relationships with God and with God's children. It is those relationships that help me feel and understand God's redemptive and reconciling love better, more deeply, and more honestly than I have before. And that is the hard part. God's love calls us to love and enter into relationship with all those around us, even those with whom we disagree. And in these difficult and divided times, that holy and life-giving love is challenging me to lean in, to move beyond, to move toward my own biases. And yet, there is nothing incompatible between loving my brothers and sisters and siblings, even those with whom I disagree, and with working for justice and reconciliation. In fact, both of these for me are the true living of and into the good news of Jesus Christ. In our baptismal covenant, a covenant we renewed last week, we affirm that with God's help, we will honor and respect the dignity of every human being. And in the very same promise, that we will strive for justice and peace among all people. This is the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Weekend, a weekend that, that is given over to reflection about his life and ministry, and more and more a weekend given to volunteering. Dr. King's ministry in life was all about justice and reconciliation. He worked tirelessly in his short life to overcome segregation and Jim Crow laws. He marched and preached and prayed for the liberation of his own people. 
and the liberation of the people who oppressed them. And his 1967 Christmas Eve sermon for peace, King talked about the hate that he had seen in the eyes and on the faces of armed sheriffs and their deputies. And King said that hate was too heavy a burden to carry. Instead, King challenged his listeners to love and to love so fiercely and completely that their soul force, their soul force, would overcome their physical force. Dr. King said, and I quote, but be assured that we'll wear you down by our capacity to suffer, and one day we will win our freedom. We will not only win freedom for ourselves, we will so appeal to your heart and conscience that we will win you in the process. And our victory will be a double victory. Love. It is love that wins. It is that love, that redeeming and sanctifying and quite frankly, indiscriminate love of God that changes us. And when we are changed by that love, we can then change this world. We can move beyond our own prejudices, our own anger, our own hurt, our own stories that we create in our head about those we do not know. And we can move into relationship. How do we begin these relationships? Maybe, maybe, just maybe, with something as simple as come and see. Amen.